Can you believe that it's already October? I have to start planning for the holidays like now. With Thanksgiving and Christmas right around the corner, I want to make sure I get everything ready on time. Stamps.com makes chaotic holiday mailing and shipping a lot easier. It's the post office that I can go to 24-7 without the traffic, hassle, or lines. I get access to all the USPS and UPS services that I need, plus I get major discounts on those rates. I use Stamps.com to print postage whenever and wherever I need it, with just a standard computer and printer. And if you need to schedule a package pickup, you can easily schedule it through the Stamps.com dashboard. Did I mention that Stamps.com offers the best rates? Stamps.com also has a switch and save feature that allows you to compare different carriers and rates, so you can choose which deal is best for you. When I use Stamps.com, I know that I am always getting the best deals, the most convenient shipping, and the easiest mailing process ever. Get ahead of the holiday chaos this year. Get started with Stamps.com today. Sign up with promo code MURDERISH for a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter code MURDERISH. The opinions expressed in this episode do not necessarily reflect those of the Murderish podcast. Sensitive topics are discussed. Listener discretion is advised. This episode involves details about a woman who died while pregnant. Please take care before listening. Be careful the company you keep. One bad mistake can change your life forever. Think with your head and not your heart. Parents have extolled these platitudes on their children for generations, usually to limited results, a rolling of the eyes, an exasperated sigh, a slamming door. But history shows us that to ignore such sage advice is to tempt fate. And it was a fate especially cruel for Margot McKee of Moses Lake, Washington. Entering the spring of 1986, Margot's story could have been ripped from a Hallmark movie. Despite losing her mother and father to cancer when she was just 12, she blossomed into a straight-A student bound and determined to escape the small town where she was raised and where she'd suffered such great tragedy. Margot attended church and volunteered around town. Her foster parents, Ross and Wyona Sterling, were satisfied they'd delivered on the promise they made to Margot's dying parents five years earlier that they would raise the brown-eyed girl as their own. But by the summer's end, Margot would be dead, her beaten and battered body buried in a shallow grave beneath a foot of sand, driftwood, and dirt. Gone, too, was the baby inside her womb. How does such a promising young life take such a dramatic and dark turn? This is Jamie, and you're listening to Murderish. Join me as I explore the murder of Margot McKee. Moses Lake in central Washington state is a place made possible by equal parts American ingenuity and American colonialism. Controlled for generations by the Columbia Band of Indians who camped along the lake's shores, collecting roots and the eggs of waterfowl. The arrival of white settlers in the mid-1800s via the Oregon Trail set up an inevitable clash over property and water rights. Before long, traditional native lands gave way to range for livestock, which in turn was replaced with a patchwork of orchards and barns. The town took its name from Chief Moses, a fierce warrior who tried unsuccessfully to keep the Columbia River Valley in native hands. Born in 1829, Moses was present in 1855 at the Stephen Council when native tribes ceded the rights to practically all of central Washington in exchange for two relatively small reservations near the Canadian border. Moses opposed the treaty and became furious when white prosecutors almost immediately overran even those small reservations his people were promised. Ironically, the place Native Americans called Hoop or Willow would later be renamed in honor of the brave chief. 
who viewed the loss of the beautiful valley as his life's greatest failure. The opening of Grand Coulee Dam about 120 miles to the north in 1942 transformed tiny Moses Lake into a 10-square-mile body of water with over 120 miles of shoreline. World War II brought Moses Lake Army Air Base, which the military used to train pilots to fly bombers made by Boeing in nearby Seattle. The dam and the base, coupled with abundant irrigation water, transformed what had been barren land into an agricultural boomtown as Moses Lake morphed into the service center of the entire Columbia Basin. That explosive growth came to an abrupt halt in 1966 with the closure of the military installation, which by that time was known as Larson Air Force Base. Located halfway between Seattle and Spokane, Moses Lake turned its attention from flight training to tourism. Today, the town attracts tens of thousands of visitors each year, mainly water sports enthusiasts and campers. The population of modern-day Moses Lake stands at 25,000 people, but in 1986, as Margot McKee was preparing to finish her senior year at Moses Lake High School, it was less than half that. In the days before the town opened its own water park, there was very little entertainment, especially for teenagers. Those who weren't involved in school activities found it difficult to fit in, according to an unnamed teacher who spoke with S.J. Guffey at the Associated Press. The teacher said, take somebody who doesn't like school and they're kind of lost. Lost perfectly describes the group that entered Margot McKee's circle in the spring of 1986. And before long, the ragtag collection of local misfits would graduate from petty theft and illegal drug use to murder. As it was to most of her friends, Moses Lake was the only hometown Margot McKee had ever known. Born April 4, 1968, her birth name was E. Margot, but everyone called her Margot. At just 12 years old, she experienced unspeakable tragedy. Both her mother and father died of cancer within a few months. Fortunately for the grief-stricken preteen, she was taken in by loving family friends Ross and Wyona Sterling, who pledged to give the small-statured brunette the best life possible under the circumstances. Ross and Wyona, who had four children of their own, owned a wrecking and towing yard in Moses Lake, and they helped start a church. Ross was an ordained minister, and the faithful couple saw little Margot as a gift from God. Wyona told the Associated Press, Before her mother died, she told Margot I was going to be her mother now. For a while, she was calling us both mom. A religious family, the Sterlings hung Bible verses throughout their small home on the eastern side of the lake. Among them, Proverbs 22, chapter 6, which reads, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. For many years, Margot did not depart from the biblical training the Sterlings provided. Rather than use the loss of her parents as an excuse to abandon her future, Margot did just the opposite, throwing herself into books, school, and church, anything that would lead her on a path away from tiny Moses Lake. Receiving stellar marks in class and staying out of trouble, she seemed destined to attend a university. But after hearing an army recruiter speak at school during her junior year, Margot decided she wanted to serve her country first. She signed up for the delayed entry program, pledging to enlist as soon as she graduated. Surprised by her decision, the Sterlings nevertheless refused to stand in the way of their foster daughter's dreams, coming to grips with the fact that she wouldn't be under their protective wings forever. Only that day would come far sooner than they expected. In March of 1986, Wyona Sterling returned home from having kidney surgery to find Margot was gone. 17 by that time, Margot had decided to move out on her own, securing an apartment while she was still a senior in high school. On the occasion of her 18th birthday, just a few weeks later, Margot came into what was at that time a healthy sum of money, around $10,000, that was left in trust by her parents. It would turn out to be a decision they'd regret from beyond the grave. Margot originally moved into the small, second-story apartment with a girl she knew from high school who had a car. 
But after only a few days, the girl's mother came to get her, telling her she was way too young to be living on her own, leaving Margot with no form of transportation. On one particular evening, while she was hanging out on the balcony alone, Margot caught the attention of a passerby, a slightly older man with scraggly blonde hair, who was on his way to a nearby party. He beckoned Margot to join him, but she turned him down. He wouldn't take no for an answer, and when Margot refused to relent, the pair ended up talking together for hours on the balcony. The young man was 21-year-old Jerry McKee. Their chance encounter was about to lead Margot down a dark, destructive, and ultimately deadly path. By all accounts, it was love at first sight. Margot, who'd never even had a boyfriend, was so enamored that she said yes when Jerry asked her to marry him only a month later. While it's unknown whether Jerry's feelings for Margot were genuine, he was aware of her impending payday when the two got married just 10 weeks after they met outside of her apartment. Margot's downward spiral had begun, and it was about to pick up at a breakneck pace. The inexperienced teenager made a bad decision to marry a high school dropout she barely knew, and even worse, by agreeing to buy a car, skip school, and take off on a honeymoon trip with Jerry and two of his friends. What was originally intended to be a week-long jaunt to Reno, Nevada, turned into a 30-day road trip that took the group as far away as Tijuana, Mexico, with stops in Las Vegas and Anaheim to visit Disneyland in between. According to an article in the Spokesman Review, by the time Margot returned, she'd been absent from school for a month and spent the bulk of her $10,000 inheritance on extravagances like a $200 a night suite at the MGM Grand Hotel on the Vegas Strip. Exhausted but determined to finish school, Margot showed up for class the next day, only to be told by the principal she wasn't welcome to return. On the eve of graduation, a milestone she'd been dreaming about since her parents died six years earlier, Margot McKee, the girl who never missed class, who studied hard and always tried her best, was expelled for excessive absences. Worse, the Army no longer wanted her because she didn't have a high school diploma. Margot's stunning downward spiral shocked everyone who knew her, not the least of which her foster parents, who'd soon learn she was pregnant with Jerry McKee's baby. It was almost impossible to fathom. Ross Sterling said to the Associated Press, it shows what can happen when a kid gets mixed up with the wrong people. But things were about to get even worse for Margot McKee. If you're hearing this ad, that's great news. You're alive, but... You can't always plan for everything. There's one thing that we can all plan on, and that's where Ethos Life Insurance comes in. Studies show that people think life insurance is three times more expensive than it actually is. But with Ethos, plans can be as low as $10 per month. Ethos offers an online application that only takes minutes. With their 100% online process, Ethos doesn't require any medical exams, only a few easy health questions. They offer competitive rates from top-rated carriers, making Ethos both affordable and convenient. My family means the world to me. I want to make sure they're protected should something happen to me. With their helpful online experts, you'll go through the life insurance process with ease and peace of mind. Join the thousands of satisfied families protected with help from Ethos who'd given the company high ratings and reviews on Google. Every year you wait, life insurance premiums increase by 8 to 10%. Get a free personalized quote at ethoslife.com slash murderish. Spelled E-T-H-O-S life dot com slash murderish. Go to ethoslife.com slash murderish to get your free life insurance quote today. Ethos Technologies, Inc. operates in California as Ethos Life Insurance Services, not available in all states and prices subject to underwriting and certain health questions. With only a couple thousand dollars of Margot's inheritance left to their names, Margot and Jerry moved into a one-bedroom apartment where Margot thought they would start their family. But life with Jerry was not at all how she pictured it. Within a few days, they were joined in the tiny apartment by two runaways, Beth Massey, 15, 
and Nancy Hughes, 16, as well as Nancy's boyfriend, Jeffrey Floda, 19. Last came long-haired and mustached Stephen Welchel, who was known around town as someone to be feared. A self-proclaimed mystic who had moved to the Pacific Northwest from California, the 20-year-old bragged, according to an article in the Walla Walla Union Bulletin, that he was a high priest of Satan who'd killed over 60 people on behalf of the mafia. Now, he was Margot's roommate. Welchel, prosecutors later said at trial, lied to scare and impress his followers, people like Jerry McKee and Jeffrey Floda, who immediately fell under his spell. Welchel asked to go by the name Jimmy Shadow Lord and told the group he had the powers to bring suffering to anyone who dared defy him. It didn't take long for the relationship between Margot and Jerry to devolve into near-constant fighting. Overwhelmed with regret for having let her dream of a better life slip through her fingers, Margot took her frustrations out on Jerry, an easy target, for spending too much time with his friends and not enough time caring for his pregnant wife. Cramped in a one-bedroom apartment with five people, all of whom she barely knew, Margot felt her privacy had been completely invaded. She didn't like Beth or Nancy, or Nancy's boyfriend, Jeffrey Floda, and she really didn't like Welchel, whom she saw as a braggart and bad influence on her husband. Meanwhile, the constant arguing between Margot and Jerry began to wear on the roommates, who'd regularly become the focus of Margot's anger. According to the AP at trial, Beth Massey said about Margot, she was so whiny all the time. Welchel, who was particularly bothered by Margot's constant badgering, began to play the role of satanic priest again. According to testimony at trial, he told the group there was a link that had to be busted and they needed to perform a ceremony at the lake to fix it. What he really meant, it was time for Margot McKee to go. Their motive was frighteningly basic. Margot McKee annoyed them, and they wanted to take whatever money she had left. Upset as she was over the situation, Margot tried to remain positive. She was actually looking forward to a trip to California that she and Jerry had been planning to take the next month in search of a fresh start before the baby arrived. It would later be debated at trial who first suggested that harm should come to Margot. Stephen said it was Jerry McKee who approached him about wanting to kill his nagging wife while they were on the road to California, with Jerry saying he wanted her dead, but that he didn't think he could commit the act himself. Jerry and Jeffrey Floda, however, pointed the finger at Stephen Welchel, whom they described as an evil force with the power to control others and a thirst for blood. On the evening of September 26th, there was another fight at the apartment, this time between Margot, Nancy, and Stephen. Margot and Jerry left the apartment to cool off, and upon their return, Margot even apologized, as reported by the Spokesman Review. But it was too late for Stephen Welchel, who'd allegedly told Jerry, tonight's the night. Before dawn the next morning, the six of them set out from the apartment on foot, under the cover of darkness, for the shores of Moses Lake, just a short distance away. They arrived around 3 a.m. September 27th. With only the harvest moon to light their path, the group made their way to a part of the lake known as Airman's Beach. Stephen and Jeffrey each carried a reinforced table leg with black electrical tape wrapped around the top. On his hip, Stephen wore a 10-inch hunting blade. Margot, confused, half-awake, and several months pregnant, came willingly, according to witnesses at trial. Accompanied by her husband and the father of her unborn baby, a teenaged Margot didn't grasp the seriousness of the situation, having viewed Stephen Welchel's tales of violence and Satanism as little more than false bravado. As they neared the shoreline, the group split up, with Margot, Beth, and Nancy heading in one direction, and Jerry, Jeff, and Stephen in another. In a scene that captured perfectly their juvenile callousness, the young men played a game of rock-paper-scissors to decide who would be the one to kill 18-year-old Margot McKee. Jeffrey won the game, but said he couldn't bring himself to do it. Disgusted, Stephen Welchel volunteered to do the job instead. After rendezvousing back on the beach, 
Stephen ordered the group to form a circle and join hands for a special satanic ritual. Annoyed and tired, but hopeful that if she just went along, it would all be over soon, Margot locked fingers with Beth and Nancy and waited for their ringmaster to give his next order. It never came. Instead, Stephen approached Margot from behind and delivered a violent blow with a club to the back of her head, knocking her to the ground. Upon seeing Margot fall, both Nancy and Jerry turned and ran. Before Jerry could get away, Stephen grabbed him by the elbow and handed him the knife, but Jerry gave it back, refusing to take part. Undeterred, Stephen resumed beating Margot about the face, chest, and abdomen. He ordered Beth and Jeff to do the same with the other table leg, according to testimony at trial. Nearly 20 minutes into the vicious beating, Stephen Welchel told Jeffrey Floda to put the dying mother into a sleeper hold. He did so, strangling out what little air she had left for a full 10 minutes. Only Margot, a fighter to the very end, refused to die. It was then Stephen uttered the words that would be repeated frequently at trial, telling the pregnant mother, you're going to die by my blade. Then he unsheathed his knife and plunged it three times into Margot's chest. When she was finally dead, Stephen let out a laugh saying, well, that's taken care of. In the end, the once promising girl who wanted to defend her country could not defend herself from her attackers. Coroners determined Margot had been struck at least 30 times with a blunt instrument and stabbed three times. Once the unspeakable act was finished, Jeffrey Floda and Stephen Welchel hastily dropped Margot's beaten and bloodied body beneath a set of bushes just a few yards from the water and made their way back to the apartment, Margot's apartment, where they found the other three waiting for them. Jerry and Stephen dumped the table legs in the countryside the next day. And a day later, Jerry and Jeffrey returned to the murder site to bury Margot's body under driftwood and sand. In the aftermath, Stephen Welchel warned his co-conspirators not to talk about the crime. But in less than 48 hours, he was telling others about the crime. The Grant County Sheriff's Department learned of the murder a few weeks later, when Moses Lake High School students told them what they'd heard. Nearly a month after her death, Margot McKee had not even been reported missing. Using the information they received, police went to the lake and found Margot's body just where they were told it would be. It was a frightening discovery, the body of an unrecognizable young woman, badly beaten and decomposed. They had to rely on dental records to make a positive ID. When word got back to Jerry that police had discovered a body at the lake, he rushed to the department to file a missing persons report, but the authorities were not fooled. He was already a prime suspect. Master criminal Stephen Welchel was not. When police pulled his truck over a week later, they found Margot's purse and the hunting blade inside. As it turned out, the killers had disposed of the table legs, but not the knife, nor the one piece of evidence that couldn't easily be explained away, Margot's purse. Stephen Welchel admitted to hearing about the plot, but tried to deny having been at the lake that early morning. Unfortunately for him, David Fraught, manager of Margot and Jerry's apartment complex, identified Stephen as having left the unit, along with the other four and Margot, just before 3 a.m. on the 27th. Fraught testified at trial, six left, but only five returned. In return for their testimony against Stephen Welchel, Jeffrey Floda, Jerry McKee, Beth Massey, and Nancy Hughes were tried in juvenile court. Jeffrey and Jerry pleaded guilty to first-degree murder by complicity, Beth and Nancy to first-degree rendering of criminal assistance. The trials of Welchel, Floda, and McKee, with their underpinnings of satanic rituals and mysticism, drew national attention. After an autopsy confirmed that Margot was pregnant, all three men faced an additional charge of manslaughter of an unborn baby, on top of the charge of first-degree murder. At their attorney's request, Jeffrey Floda and Jerry McKee were tried separately from Stephen Welchel, 
a decision that would later be called into question. According to the AP, on the stand, Nancy Hughes told jurors that she'd heard a conversation between Stephen and Jerry two weeks before the killing, during which Stephen told Jerry he would kill Margot on the way to California. Nancy testified, he's like, tell you what, I'll kill her on the way out. Don't worry about it, I got you covered. Beth Massey implicated Jerry McKee on the stand. According to the AP, she said, he was still mad at Margot and he was going to kill her. Steve had asked Jerry if tonight was the night and Jerry said yes. Though difficult to hear, prosecutors wanted the jury to understand how badly Margot suffered the night she died. Nancy testified that during the beating, Margot McKee had called out to God to make Satan stop because Stephen had convinced her that he was the devil himself. Nancy also turned against her former friend, Beth Massey, telling the jury, according to the AP, that Beth told her that after she hit Margot once, she couldn't stop. At trial, the jury learned about Margot's past, about her dreams for the future, about how things had fallen apart after she and Jerry were married. Yet despite all their troubles, Margot had held on to hope that things could get better, maybe because that's all she knew. According to the Spokesman Review, a classmate cleaning out her high school locker a few days after Margot's body was found discovered heartbreaking reminders of how innocent and kind Margot was. The classmate discovered notes that Margot had written to her foster mother, Wyona Sterling, promising to make her proud. The classmate also found a note with a list containing all the things that Margot could do so that she and Jerry wouldn't fight. On January 31, 1987, a jury found Jerry McKee and Jeffrey Floda guilty of first-degree murder, the deliberations lasting a little over 10 and a half hours, according to reporting by the Walla Walla Union Bulletin. The Bulletin reported that in his closing arguments, Grant County Prosecutor Paul Clayson told the jury that Imargo McKee was a rose surrounded by noxious weeds. Jerry McKee and Jeffrey Floda, ages 21 and 19, received the minimum recommended sentence for first-degree murder under the state's Sentencing Reform Act, just 20 years. Prosecutor Clayson had asked for 28. As for Stephen Welchel, he was tried at the same time in Seattle, having been granted a motion for change of venue based on all the negative news coverage around the case. Invoking their constitutional rights against self-incrimination, Jeffrey Floda and Jerry McKee refused to testify against Welchel. McKee, his attorney said, didn't want to appear at Welchel's trial because he was concerned about going to prison as a snitch. But their voices were still present at trial courtesy of tape-recorded statements made to law enforcement before the proceedings began. A motion to deem the tapes as inadmissible was denied by the judge. Despite almost no physical evidence tying Welchel to Margot McKee, her blood was never found on Welchel or any of his possessions. The state of Washington came to trial with a mountain of circumstantial proof. Beyond the audio tapes of Flota and Jerry McKee and the testimony of the two former runaways, prosecutors had a series of witnesses who testified to having heard Stephen Welchel admit to the crime, the victim of his own hubris. One witness, a friend of Welchel's, told the jury that Welchel told him he killed Margot because she was a nag. According to the Spokesman Review, another witness said, he told me that he had killed somebody and that he would do it again for a friend and asked me if I was a friend. Stephen Welchel took the stand and tried to pin the murder on his co-defendants, saying he only helped in trying to cover up the crime after the fact, once Jerry and Jeff confessed to what they'd done. The Walla Walla Union Bulletin reported that Welchel spoke in a mostly expressionless, even voice while on the stand. Welchel even suggested that Margot had a hand in her own demise, telling the jury about a fight she and Jerry had the night of her death. According to the Union Bulletin, Welchel testified, she hauled off and slapped Jerry. Jerry was very angry because she had never struck him before. The night of September 27th, Welchel testified that he was back at the apartment drinking with McKee and Flota when they told him what had happened. 
The Union Bulletin reported, he said McKee told him that Margot McKee and Hughes exchanged words and got into a slugfest, then took a walk to cool their tempers, with Flota and Massey grabbing clubs made from table legs because it was unsafe in the neighborhood. But the jury were not buying it. In a last-ditch effort to save their then 20-year-old son, Welchel's parents testified that he was at home at the time that Margot was being killed, testimony that was effectively rebutted by Beth Massey's mother, who told the jury how she'd gone to Stephen Welchel's house the day of the crime looking for her daughter, only to be told that Stephen had not been home all night. It was all the jury needed to hear. In June of 1987, after four days of deliberation, a jury convicted Welchel of first-degree murder in the death of Margot McKee. At sentencing, Welchel was allowed to address the court. His statement went on for nearly an hour. In a rambling soliloquy, the one they called Shadow Lord maintained his innocence, accepting responsibility for helping to cover up the crime, but insisting he wasn't there when Margot was murdered. The real killers, said Welchel, were Jerry McKee and Beth Massey. According to the Spokesman Review, Welchel said, Law enforcement has wanted me and my family out of this county for some time. He concluded by saying, I'm afraid now that I've said these things, I will not see my appeal. A judge sentenced Welchel to 28 years in prison, calling what he did senseless and cruel. But he said he couldn't find a compelling reason to go beyond the standard sentencing range. Stephen Welchel made good on his promise to the judge, filing an appeal almost immediately based on several constitutional arguments, the most significant of which was the admission of taped statements from Jeffrey Flota and Jerry McKee, which his attorneys argued should have been disallowed on account the pair were co-defendants and stood to benefit from pinning the blame on Welchel. They also argued Welchel did not get to exercise his constitutional right to confront his accusers because Jerry McKee and Flota had refused to testify. A lower court rejected the appeal. Welchel appealed that decision to the Washington Supreme Court, which granted him a review on the issue of whether the tape-recorded statements should have been allowed under the Confrontation Clause of the Sixth Amendment. The state Supreme Court again found for the prosecution, deciding the tapes were wrongly admitted but that they had little to do with the final outcome because of overwhelming, untainted evidence of the defendant's guilt presented at trial. In his last stop before the U.S. Supreme Court, Welchel took his case to the Ninth District Court of Appeals, which found in his favor, ruling that the tapes had a substantial and injurious effect on the influence of the jury. In 1998, after almost 11 years behind bars, Stephen Welchel was granted a new trial. U.S. District Judge Robert Whaley made the order on the basis that Welchel had not been allowed to confront his co-defendants. Whaley said, McKee and Flota had a strong incentive to misrepresent their role in the murder and shift the blame. But before a new trial could be held, the state offered Welchel a deal, make an Alford plea and be allowed to walk free. An Alford plea meant that Welchel would formally plead guilty while not admitting guilt. In June of 2002, Stephen Welchel, now 35, was released from prison after spending 15 years behind bars. Less than two years later, on January 1, 2004, he was pronounced dead of undisclosed reasons, according to public records. As for Margot McKee, her memory lives on as a painstaking reminder of just how quickly one or two bad decisions can turn a promising young life upside down. Her foster parents, Ross and Wyona Sterling, carried on for many years after her death. Wyona died in 1999, Ross in 2017, at the age of 93. Thank you for joining me on this episode. Don't forget to check out my newly revamped and upgraded Patreon perks. Murderish Behind the Mic Patreon membership is a great option for those who've listened to every episode of Murderish and don't want to wait for the next one to drop because bonus ad-free episodes are just one of the perks available for Murderish Behind the Mic patrons. 
Other perks include exclusive behind the scenes content from inside my podcast studio, live virtual meet and greets, ad free episodes with bloopers, and merch packages. To sign up for Murderish Behind the Mic, visit murderish.com or just go to patreon.com and search for Murderish there. Make sure you're subscribed to my other podcast, Dirty Money Moves Women in White Collar Crime. The podcast follows my investigation of a woman I met a few years ago, a woman who turned out to be a prolific scam artist. It's a wild story that even has ties to the Michael Jackson scandal. You can subscribe to Dirty Money Moves wherever you're listening right now. There are quite a few episodes for you to binge. Do me the biggest favor and tell your friends about Murderish and leave the show a positive rating and review in any podcast app. To show your support, you can also just wear a Murderish t-shirt while you're out and about. And trust me, it's a great conversation starter. Go to Murderish.com to buy t-shirts, bags, coffee mugs, and so much more. Follow Murderish on Instagram and TikTok at Murderish Podcast. I've been doing a lot of fun videos there. Murderish sound design and audio editing is by Justin Hellstrom. Some of the music was composed by Nico Vitisse of We Talk of Dreams. This episode was researched and written by Kay Brandt. For a list of sources used for this episode, visit Murderish.com. As always, Ishers, thank you for joining me on another episode of Murderish. And remember, listening to this podcast doesn't make you a murderer. It just means you're murder-ish.